Our first winner is Eleanor Ambler uh, in the poetry category. Eleanor Ambler is an English and sociology major at ASU Online. Some of her favorite writing experiences at ASU have been participating in the Penn Project internship and getting to explore her creative voice in various writing workshop classes. Eleanor will be reading to us from Serenade, A Childhood Dream. Please, Eleanor. Thank you for that introduction and thank you to the homecoming committee and the awards committee, like you said. Um, this is Serenade, A Childhood Dream. We swirling women block the sun. Only darkness for the first sin repeated in living flesh, sagging breasts fail a test, we are not worthy. Children marvel as tool dances between our legs. We marvel as we billow waif-like into air. We dream of translucent skinned flowing limbs shifting against substanceless skirts. Mass is mess no one wants to see in a suit of skin, he said. It echoes in purportedly empty skulls. Let the ocean wash us into bones identical, replace femur with ulna, we are all the same. Can a dream come bound with tethers? On stage, synthetic lights shadow each curve blue. Whale blue, round blue, berry blue, barren blue, baby blue. An army of infants, we stand fixated on form, frozen behind the fourth wall. Men lick rough tongues up our thinly veiled thighs. They sense our thirst for water and mistake it for something else. Can a dream come free from tethers? Ballet is lines moving through space towards infinity, he said. Exercise circles from our souls and roundness from our hearts. Our purpose is singular. We exist as vessels. Is it wrong to dream of moving against the infinite? We approach to unblur our faces in this swirling mass of dancing. Thank you, Eleanor. That was wonderful. Uh, and if you, uh, those of you who want to use the um, applause um, reaction button, of course, are uh, welcome to do so. Your little, your little applauding hand will show up. Uh, we will proceed then to uh, our next winner in the fiction nonfiction category. Uh, the winner is Timothy Allen Nathan. Timothy Allen Nathan is a veteran of the U.S. Army and a ship supervisor at Starbucks in Lee Summit, Missouri. He's currently a student at Arizona State University and pursuing a bachelor's degree in English. Uh, while using his benefits from Starbucks College Achievement Plan, SCAP, uh, he's also had an amazing opportunity to learn conveniently with a great innovative university in a subject that is fulfilling and which will help him accomplish his goal of becoming a professional storyteller. Timothy will be reading to us from Sinking Rocks. Hi there. Thank you, everybody, uh, the awards committee and the homecoming committee. Thank you all so much and everybody who's here today. Um, like you said, my uh, short fiction is Sinking Rocks. So uh, we'll get right into it. Um, he had a grisly five o'clock shadow and bloodshot eyes when he approached the, that morning on the pier. I was tossing rocks with the other boys my age, giggling every time the rock plunked on the first skip. He'd berate us, saying we shouldn't test the fates. Why would such a wretched old man with a nose like the bow of a ship and the voice of a withered crow insistently wave his arm, shooing us from fun? When I was around the age, that girl seemed a little more important, and my voice cracked like waves against the shore. He looked on angrily from his fishing hut. Just as stubborn about keeping the water to himself. You've got eyes like an emerald in the sky, a girl we used to pick on told me. Confidence catching me by surprise and curling lips at the edge of a mischievous smile, trapping my senses and stealing my heart. She skipped rocks with me on the pier where we had our first kiss. One, two, plunk. Red wax on a heavy letter addressed to me made her cry all night long. A war was waging with the Empire. The Senate had no choice but to pull every able body to the front. I took her hand and led her to the pier. The old man didn't yell at us anymore. He just sat there staring into the sea, longing for something. Her belly swelled and my hands grew weathered from constructing the crib. Pressing my fingers against her skin, I could feel the touch of a, 
of a child I'd never meet, Plunk. We laughed one last time together as the, as the stone sank after three skips. At the end of each of her letters, she kept counting her skips before they stopped coming. One, two, three, Plunk. I returned years later with one less eye. The pier felt like a distant dream. She passed in childbirth, and the child didn't make it either, I found out. I'd sit on the pier night after night, wishing she'd emerge from the sea, that all those stones we tossed would come skipping back until he appeared from his hut and approached me, knowing. Robert was his name. He was a fisherman, he said, but I'd never seen him go out to sea once. Together, we sat on the pier, drinking, laughing, and telling stories about the wars we fought. It was during his last days that he came to skip with me a man in his 80s, his ship making its last voyage. He told me how his son had died, an incident while fishing, drowned at four, not much younger than I, when he yelled at us all those years ago. He threw his last stone and smiled. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plunk. Thank you so much, Timothy. Uh, we'll continue with the third category, the scholarly essay category. Uh, the winner is Thomas Bate. Uh, Thomas Bate is an English literature major here at ASU. He is a member of Barrett, the Honors College, and over the years he has been a writing tutor for the University Academic Success Programs and has been selected as part of a small group of exemplary students to advise for the English Department Academic Program Review, ARP. A uh, current highlight of his ASU experience is his internship with the Pen Project, uh, ASU's program of editing the literary works of prisoners at a New Mexico correctional facility. He will be going to graduate school in California in the fall of 2022 to start training to become a practicing psychotherapist. He is honored to have received his award and very grateful to the department. Uh, Thomas will be reading from Rank with Beauty, the Sublime Experience of Nabokov's Lolita. So I've got rather a long introduction. I think I got a bit carried away there. Um, those are really beautiful readings. Uh, I now have the more prosaic task of reading from a scholarly essay. Um, I'll, I'll just read the end because it's, it's quite long. But my basic point is I, I, it's about Lolita, which is my favorite book. Um, and I'm asking, like, who is Lolita? You know, it, it, does she represent anything as a character? Because Nabokov hated all symbolism, you know, metaphor and everything like that. So uh, this is how I kind of wrap it up. Um, <clears throat> Nabokov and his protagonist Humbert consequently make it their mission to realize the ideal through art, as Phyllis Roth says, to transcend the banality of mort uh, mortality. Uh, oh, to transcend the banality and mortality of a common reality, which is shared by all Nabokovian characters and by Nabokov himself, and with which we identify ourselves in Lolita. Martin Amos writes that Humbert, who's the protagonist, um, is of that dangerous and rare breed of people, often represented in Nabokov's corpus, who, because they cannot make art out of life, make their lives into art. Another example of such a character in fiction that springs to mind is Shakespeare's Iago, who likewise revels in the divinity of hell. Whether the author intended it or not, Lolita undoubtedly became a prime example of the transformative power of art, and did so, and did, and did so not didactically, for although a monumental achievement in matters cerebral, it is Lolita's emotional, irrational, and romantic grandeur that ultimately carries the day and makes immortal the most perverted romance that ever was in stark accordance with Humbert's final wish. This essay sought to elucidate the myriad ways in which Nabokov's prose style and imagery reflected his insistence on writing solely for the sake of the pleasure. Respectful of the author's supreme distaste for overanalysis and loose interpretation, this essay has not claimed that one should take anything away from the experience of Lolita other than the sole wish expressed on the part of the author for it to deliver aesthetic bliss. That said, this essay concluded by suggesting that the book's very existence is itself a comment on the nature of art. But one must ask if this is something that is ultimately in the author's control. 
I think that it is not. Lolita then has become a book that is, quote, allegorical of itself, end quote, as Brendan McGill so perceptively claims. For if we, view, if we view Lolita the character, not as a symbol, but merely as a novel experience, to borrow Nabokov's own ironic pun, then we see that Lolita the book and Lolita the character are really one. In finally answering the question of who is Lolita, one must simply reply, she is a book. She is a work of art named Lolita, for they both mean the same thing. Both are constructed only from Humbert's perspective. Both, therefore, appear staggeringly beautiful. Both render the reader a guilty and nervous wreck, yet both transport us into a higher realm of pure and potent bliss. In spite of ourselves, Lolita is left our sin, our soul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was really, um, really quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> so um, that concludes the readings that we have um, for today. Uh, I would like to congratulate all of the winners, of course. Uh, you've done a fantastic job, and we're really grateful that you could come out and share, um, share that work with us today. Um, of course, thank you all also to all of you have uh, to the audience who chose to uh, participate and listen in um, this afternoon. And uh, for participating in the English department's uh, homecoming efforts this year. Uh, I believe we have a short time period that we could spend on if anyone has any questions to any of the um, writers before we wrap it up. We are all mute. <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, I'll jump in and ask a question, Kaiser. Please, please do, Chris. Since I'm a teacher of uh, writing, I'm always interested in process. I wonder if each of them could talk a little bit about their process of writing for the particular genres that they're uh, uh, writing in. We could start with a uh, with a poetry winner, maybe. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so for me, poetry um, it's important to find like an emotional truth, maybe that's cliche to say, but um, sort of pulling from my own emotional experiences. So this poem in particular was based on, um, I'm a professional ballet dancer, and that has been a dream since I was very young. Um, and the reality of it is in many ways a dream come true, but in other ways, there are sort of some darker sides of it that I did not anticipate as a five-year-old um, dreaming of tutus. And so this poem was sort of pulling that together. Um, and as I was writing, I was thinking a lot about the sounds too, sort of the sounds and the rhythm um, and how to simulate dance and music with those. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you succeeded. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. How about you, Timothy? Hi, um, it's a good question. I wish I could say I had a very calculated way of, or uh, very calculated um, procedure in which I wrote my material. However, um, a it's lot of it- It's more interesting when you don't. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, uh, fantasy and writing fantasy and fiction is kind of in my bones at this point. Um, so a lot of times what will happen is I'll go for a walk and uh, just a particular idea will catch me. And um, for this particular story, uh, I do kind of extract some of my personal history and put it into here uh, as, um, as, is it Kaisa? Is that how you say it? Perfect. Uh, okay. So uh, as you as you said earlier in my small bio, um, I, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army. So um, some of the emotions from... Uh, being deployed and and uh, being away from family and friends went into the story a bit uh, as the protagonist uh, is called away to war and comes back to kind of a broken home. Um, and so that that kind of went into the process a bit. Um, however, a lot of it honestly is, uh, you know, people say there's there's planners and panthers. I, I'm definitely a panther. I just I <laughs> it comes to me I write it down and I hope it looks good and then after three or four edits I hope for the best that's that's really cool thank you uh how about you Thomas 
Um, well, I'm a big believer in Cormac McCarthy's idea that writing is a process of like extracting your unconscious thoughts, you know, so you write, it'll kind of come to you. My dogs are barking, that's me. Um, <laughs> your dog I also, <laughs> I also think the same is true of reading. I think when you read, your own unconscious becomes revealed to you. So when I start an essay, I do like a week of just reading critical essays, like as many as I can. Um, and something comes out like a theme and I'm like, oh, that kind of, everyone's skirting around the edges of this idea, but they, maybe they've not written on it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then the idea comes and I'm like, oh, hang on, well, this is what I think. And this is what I want to write about. And, then, and that's how it comes out. So I guess that's the essay writing process for me, but I think those were great answers, um, mm -hmm. you know, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to all of you. Uh, and thank you for sharing that, uh, how, um, uh, as Chris asked about the, the process of, um, of how you get going and uh, what triggers uh, your imaginative process. Um, I think uh, that concludes um, the proceedings for today. And again, just lastly, I'd like to re reiterate that um, thank you so much to all of you. Congratulations to the three winners. And uh, thank you for participating in uh, our homecoming efforts this year. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>